welcome to yet another in the ongoing saga that is the Defeasible Reasoning Podcast. My name is Professor Andrew Rosema, broadcasting live from the 63rd story of the Grand Rapids Community College Media Center, part of the Grand Rapids Community College Center for Cybersecurity Studies, a CAE2Y Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity. I am here today with the multi-talented Aphrodite, aka Apple Jones, who is an experienced educator, a technology and business continuity leader, a privacy and information security awareness leader, currently plying her trade at a major healthcare provider here in West Michigan. That sounds good. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Apple, welcome and hello. And let, Thank you. Let me, as usual, introduce the, the third person in the room, executive producer slash co-host, Noda Smith. What's up? There we go. <laughs> uh, so uh, I understand that you were subjected to the, the current bevy of uh, defeasible reasoning pods that are out there right now? I was, and I was glad you asked because you need an intelligent, strong woman's point of view. <laughs> Luckily, we have one of those to hand. This works out well. I'm glad we managed to snag you in here. This, for the listener, you may not know because of the technical excellence that Noah brings to every project wow. he's involved with. We kind of sprang this one on him about five minutes ago, and he managed to pull it all together now. So yeah. kudos to you, sir. Surprise pod. Indeed. You need to do what, you know, someday there'll be a big IT cybersecurity thing, and we'll have to jump right into it. But lu luckily, um, you know, it didn't take that much to just... Throw it all together. It's amazing. It's amazing <laughs> to watch you work, sir. We're all professionals. I think we can handle it. That's right. So um, what I've been doing recently in a very uh, superhero gender biased kind of way is asking everybody about being bit by this radioactive spider. I, I need to ask you about your super heroine origin story. And so I imagine it involves an island in the middle of the Pacific with a force field that makes it invisible. And there's some kind of bracelets involved and a lasso. Yeah, I'm a big Wonder Woman fan. So okay. I'm old enough to have been a child when the Wonder Woman television show was on the air. The one with the... the Linda Carter. Thank yeah. You. yeah, and I'm a huge fan. While I like the new Wonder Woman, I'm kind of partial to Linda Carter. Gotcha. There will, there will only ever be one And so I literally, like, a, as a six-year-old, ran around with, like, the bracelets and saved the world in my own home. Gotcha. Did you ask people to shoot guns at you and try and deflect them and then discover the folly of your ways? Or was that just me? <laughs> no, I like the lasso part a lot, though. Gotcha. By the way, the to... bullet holes in your arm are <laughs> grotesque. So I thought I was a superhero. Was, uh, that's real. I thought I could fly through windows. Wind, uh. Windows are sharp. <laughs> Some, I'm, I'm one of those people who has to learn things the mm. hard way. I think my biggest compliment, though, was last year at CareerQuest, another professor from a different school, when I said that I saw myself as a Wonder Woman, he said, oh, I always saw you more like Ray in Star Wars. Oh. That's a big compliment. And, and see, adequately nerdy for the environment. So what is the origin story, though? What got you into... So you are currently uh, sort of responsible for teaching people to be good IT users? Well, I'm doing uh, education and training for privacy and information security in said big health core organization. Right, right. So what does that entail? What's a day in the life look like? Well, it's interesting because there's lots of things that fall under that. And I, given my career in education, I also do a lot with their talent development of their security engineers and provide opportunities for them, not train them myself because they're engineers and I'm not. <clears throat> so as the trainer portion and the educator portion, you know, that's a compliance issue. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure that certain things are educated. As I always say, there's really two different sides to that education. There's a side that is the mandatory compliance portion and you then there's comply. yeah and then there's the side that actually changes the culture and gets people to really change how they operate i think it's really important that the general workforce know enough to not be naive and be able to assist uh security but of course security can stop a lot of things so the user never has, never has to see them so, so don't like, you want to know my whole origin story? Well, I mean, like I was super impressed with hearing all the cool origin stories. Well, well yeah. So I was a science. I was a science nerd. Okay. And my goal was to be a biologist. Actually, I wanted to be a big cat feline ethologist. What is uh, ethology? So it's a combination of biology and psychology. Oh, so you wanted to understand yeah. why the lion just. And ate then me. I did a paper in college that told me I'd have to go to school forever and would still not make any money. Now, had I known you'd be able to do like reality TV. That might have changed my mind, but you know, I'm too old for that. I seem to recall you teaching a class in biometrics? 
if I'm not remembering correctly? I did not teach the biometrics, but okay. as the person who uh, hired the teachers, gotcha. I'm quite familiar with, <laughs> with the different. department's classes. It's a different deal. Mm -hmm. So not big cat shrinkology. Instead, yeah. you wind up. So I landed into technology. I actually, while I was in college, was a medical biller. So that's funny. I hid that for a long time and now it's come full circle and it's useful in my there you go. You're back in the medical So I field. understand a lot of that. But yeah, I spent uh, my undergrad is in network management and then I have an MBA in e-business and uh, some doctoral classes in education leadership. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting place to wind up. And would you say that you are like, I, I see you at every single cybersecurity yeah. event I go to. Would you say you are immersed in the West Michigan cybersecurity culture? I would say yes. I like to see myself as somebody who assists the engineers to communicate their mission. Gotcha. Gotcha. So like help explain to these people why you need to stop clicking on the links. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you do? Is that what you do? You just scream? Is that effective? Um, no, that's not really effective. Okay. I think that when you're training, uh, humor is effective. Wait. So I've been trying that with my intern, just screaming and it's not working. Really? <laughs> And I think a little bit of scare my tactic. my dropout rates in my classes. You so, know, I always so that, say if so, I'm doing a live training, the yeah. best compliment I can get is, now I'm scared out of my mind, right? So then they've listened. Oh, you're just mm -hmm. sca scaring them is the best yeah, topic. Yeah, you tell them what can go wrong, right? I have a, um, a slide deck that is my uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt slide deck. Like, here's all the scary stuff going on in cybersecurity today. I update it every now and again. Sometimes do it for, like, teacher learning day. It's, uh, it's entertaining. I was wondering... Uh, if you have seen the sort of flip recently, having been on the academic side of the world yep. and so like the reverse of what I did where I can't kind of came from industry and then now I'm, I'm in this weird place where we teach people things, um, what that's like doing that trip backwards and if the, if the sort of response you get to teaching people in industry is different when you're teaching people in an academic setting. Um, I think that the students still want to learn. I think that, you know, obviously I don't have any homework, which is nice for me. I don't have to grade. The grading evaluation um, part. But I think that I find that most of the people that we teach, they really do want to help, right? They want to understand where the security team can help them and where they have to help the security team. Gotcha. And I think that one of the things too is that engineers have a lot to communicate to the greater workforce, but sometimes they need that translator, right? Indeed. Sometimes um, difficult to find people who can both talk zeros mm -hmm. and ones and yeah. also talk. Oh, they're brilliant, management. brilliant engineers who can speak amazing things, but, you know, possibly a nurse doesn't need to know all of that. That's my big <laughs> question I ask the engineers is, does a nurse really need to know that? That's a, that's a good question to ask. So would you consider yourself the glue that holds West Michigan cybersecurity community together? Well, I think a that's a bit strong, uh, but, but I would say I'm part of the glue, I hope. I, I, would, I, I would wholeheartedly agree. And the reason I, I bring it up is because uh, the previous pod, we had a guy on who does, actually, we have, a, we have someone who uh, you might remember probably showed some executives their passwords one time, who's now a, um, who's now a, a penetration tester working for a company in town. And I, I tried to get out of him where he thought networking, not like the OSI model networking, but like networking with the yeah. humans, how that had impacted his career. And I don't know as I heard the answers I thought he was going to tell me from him. I'm wondering if, if you have seen how networking impacts people's careers in this business. Absolutely. When I um, shifted out of education and back into the workforce and um, people are kind of surprised they didn't really look for a job, right? Job came to me, asked me to apply. And um, people ask me, well, how do I go about networking and getting those kind of contacts? I said, well, you don't try to network when you're looking for a job, <laughs> yeah, right? People can kind point. of smell the need fear. and the desperation. I think that one of the things is to make yourself really available. I mean, I networked because I had interest in the communities and to make sure that some of the things I'm very interested in making sure that the youth really sees the purpose for technology. And so I do things like career quests, that's one of my most favorite things I do every year. It's a little exhausting to have 9,000 children. Students roll right through. But yeah. it is something that makes sure that they're looking at technology as a career. And so I think that people know that I'm someone who is genuinely trying to be part of the community. My kids are like fish in the technology water. So they don't really realize that they're like swimming in technology mm -hmm. all day, every day. They just kind of like... We're Facebooking and we're tweetering and, and I'm sure they're on the MySpace app. 
and and doing all the friend stirring <laughs> and uh the oct i could never pronounce that one the o the the german but anyway like <laughs> they don't they don't realize that there's there's a whole machinery that goes into making all of this stuff happen certainly they see the convenience and the entertainment but not necessarily the productivity and the need to secure it the need to secure it it's, it's hard to impress upon people so what what i find really fascinating is you're kind of this bridge between experts and lay people. Sure. Would you, would you say that's sure. kind of in a... my teaching career, a lot of the classes I taught were what I would call as the business of IT. But one of the classes I regularly taught was that first freshman computer class that the non-tech majors took. So the the medical majors, the business majors. So I've spoken to them a lot. Gotcha. And and uh, tried to take that knowledge into what I do now. Cool, because I think. That happens a lot, and I'm thinking of a particular subject <laughs> that I may not mention due to its uh, occasional polarizing, uh, politically polarizing uh, attributes, but I think there are instances a lot where there are experts saying that um, there is something that needs to happen or that there, the, there are facts, and here are the facts. And for whatever reason, that are message... Are talking about the need to regulate social media? <laughs> Or maybe the need to regulate the amount of chlorofluorocarbons carbons and... Who knows what I'm talking about. Any but of those things would be... I mean, I did watch example. 10 hours of Senate hearings with Mark Zuckerberg, so... Okay. And so sometimes that the expert's message, for whatever reason, just does not get through to people. Or inexplicably, it becomes this two-sided um, issue. Um, and have you found that there is... I'm sure there's not any kind of magic bullet or single solution but have you found that there is something that happens often or something common that you that is easy to solve in that um link between the communicating the experts message and people then oh actually getting it and, and believing the experts i think that's a great question because i think it really just comes down to meeting the individual at the thing that's important to them right so whether it's them training them through training them what would help their children Right. So I believe very strongly that to get the message out, we need to make sure they also feel like they want to be secure at home. Right. Mm -hmm. So we give a lot of home tips, not just work tips, because if they become more secure in general, they're also more secure at work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so phishing is probably one of our biggest topics, because that's one of the things that the general population can really do is educate themselves on being aware and being suspicious. Right. A little bit of little bit of suspicious goes a long way. And so we try to use like real examples. So we have like emails that have actually come in um, and that have been caught and kind of explain and break down where those issues lie. And then of course we do some internal phishing too, right? Um, just to kind of, and, and I believe very strongly that when you're doing internal phishing, you have to be very honest about that. So we communicated that we were going to do it. We explained that it's education. We even have like a FAQ section that kind of shows them what the education page looks like if they get it, you know, and just kind of explains our purpose is really to train and get you more aware, not to, you know, make you feel like you did something foolish. A, you know, any security professional will tell you it's not about, you know, if you've been hacked, it's about when. Especially, Everybody has. Especially if you're talking about an organization of your size. Um, the more I think about it, the more I realize I stole most of my fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, PowerPoint presentation from you guys. Uh, <laughs> so, so is there um, how many lashes does a user get if they were to click on one of the phishing emails for the? They're fired. No, <laughs> no, certainly not. I mean, if you fail them a couple times, we might we have a training piece that's that can be delivered e-learning. We mm -hmm. call it "Fight the Fish." Uh, you know, a little humor goes a long ways. There's a side in the security operations center that it's looking at those real pieces coming in. So we try to communicate with them a little bit to see if we can reach out to specific departments that maybe are being targeted, right? Because right. some of this phishing is just going to be just mass market, right? Sure. But some of it is really targeting the finance department or, you HR. know, HR pieces that are going to have some better information and communicating and having a conversation. So we look for that kind of stuff too to educate them and come down and do some specialized stuff. So clearly we have some content that is the same, 
no matter who we're talking to. But we also try to customize to the needs of that department. Mm. I find that going to a department meeting is quite effective because then you have the entire department, you have the support of the leader, and you have a captured audience, which is always good. I find that my department meetings are almost completely ineffective. That's amazing. <laughs> well, it's not my department meeting, right? I'm the uh, guest. Actually, maybe it's because I'm running them. So um, <laughs> this podcast gives me a lot of opportunities for self-reflection. Uh, so is the unicorn party still a thing? Is is Does that happen from time to time? So what do you mean by that? We don't give out... Unicorn know, parties? We, we don't nope. give out uh, the address to that or anything. Oh, okay. That's fine. <laughs> but, it, but it still occurs? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can, mm. I, can I have the address after we're done? Maybe. I want to go to a unicorn party. What is party. a unicorn party, I must ask? So there used to be some places. I'm sure they don't do this anymore. But one of the things that's in my fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, presentation is an example of a thing you might do to encourage users, uh, particularly sensitive users who have access to important stuff, to get in the habit of the old Windows L, mm -hmm. or the whatever it is on a Mac, oh, to yeah, lock yeah. your workstation before you get up and, and walk And it's away. embarrassing you when you don't. Mm. Right. And I have a friend uh, down in Georgia, not the devil, but close, who <laughs> did his PhD research on whether sort of like negative uh, feedback effectuates change. And he seems to think not. But I don't know if he had unicorns involved. But uh, it, so like, you forget to lock something. We make a... A statement that says this person was the last person to like their uh, email because somebody sent out a invitation to the unicorn party with their email account. Uh, to the entire department. Yeah. Interesting. It's really effective in security, right? Yeah. Because the security people should be the most secure. You would hope. Right. That mm -hmm. does happen in this in this office actually when certain people and there are <laughs> there's a, an individual in particular who is typically the culprit, but we send emails to each other when that has been left open and, and unlocked. So um, it's not just the security people. Right. <laughs> nice. It's good to know that. At a previous, Keep them accountable. Yeah. At a previous employer, I had an employee that would actually send out a recurring appointment <laughs> when Ooh. it happened. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this appointment occurs every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from now until the end of time. I imagine as an outsider, this industry is pretty well male dominated. Is that Accurate I, I would say that's true. I mean, certainly I think that information security is a little bit less, but okay. still male dominated than others. Right. So like programming, I find, you know, they have some females, but there's parts niches, especially networking, right? Is that true? is very hmm. male. Um, I think security is a little more diverse. Oh, okay. Um, but it's still not equal. Let's yeah. put it that way. I was just going to ask if you encountered in your journey through this industry, any challenges that seemed silly um i don't think i do because i've yeah. been in the industry a long time and i actually come out of higher ed and we were a center of academic excellence so you know i have a really good strong understanding of all the different i always say that my education of security is very broad not necessarily super deep right go panthers go panthers mm -hmm. and so i don't think that i do but i see it right i've actually had some discussions with different leaders and different companies be like hey what you just did maybe Maybe you ought to think about how that impacts things. Like when, gotcha. you know, when there's a room full of people and it's the young female who's asked to take all the notes, right? Mm, right These are yeah, not yeah. things I think people think about, but they can be things that become habitual. Right. And can, you know, create an atmosphere. I, I don't think that West Michigan is as bad. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think West Michigan is as bad as what some of the things we've seen from Silicon Valley. Oh, interesting. Yeah. For sure. You uh, also are gifted with something of a forceful personality. <laughs> I uh, am. I, I've never been accused of being quiet or... Something of a wallflower. Yeah. Um, I did a disc profile, you know, years ago and it came out as inspirational, hmm. which I think kind of goes, it I didn't surprise me because I think that's been what my whole career is based on is sort of inspiring people to find what they want to do in life sometimes they don't know right have you given any thought to so i'm i'm raising a son and a daughter and i've, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this um this whole impact of how does like biology affect what you want to do and they've both had computers since mm -hmm. forever which is probably not great i do internet filtering but there's i feel like when they're smart enough to get around the internet filtering they're smart enough to to do what they need to do so um my i I find that they both play games. So my son, Andrew, likes to play a game called Geometry Dash, which you may have seen, which is a, basically a one-button phone game that's sort of grown. But what he likes to do is make levels for Geometry Dash. Sometimes he shares them with friends, solicits feedback, takes that into consideration, fixes things. What my daughter does with her computer is she's into a game called Roblox. 
where not familiar. you can construct worlds. It's really the, the, the cool thing about it is that it gives kids opportunities to build their own games and also swindle each other. Some of the worst fishing I've ever seen goes on in Roblox because they pay Robux for things. <laughs> I digress. That's a, that's not germane to my point, but the, um, but what she likes is to, she likes to build communities in those virtual worlds. So her game these days is a wolf pack game where like you can be the head wolf and then you get all these little pups around you. And I think what that illustrates to me is sort of the, and I, I try actively to anti-foster this, but what I've heard a lot of discussion about is the, the interest in things versus people. Yeah. And do you find that to be true in the industry that, um, you know, the, the, we're talking about bell curves here, right? And bell curves have a middle and they have outsiders. Mm -hmm. And it it is at least my experience with my children and has been my experience with my students frequently that it tends to be that the part of this business that interests women tends to be the people end of it, which yeah. I think is probably the most important end of it. I mean, we're only going to do so well, much and I think code. that not just the people end of it, but sometimes the communication end of it. Indeed, versus the thing end of it where I am like playing with an object that I enjoy. And it seems to me that like, I don't know is that's a fundamental difference we want to fix. And it's interesting that you say that because coming out of education, I spent a lot of time telling ladies who are applying, you know, there's places for you in management, IT managers do really well sometimes as women. And uh, then I go into industry. I know several who are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're superstars, right? The women quite, who are in have, security are superstars. Have done well for themselves yeah. in terms of a, a satisfying career and that dollar dollar bill. Sure. Paper. Making, Paper. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but I but I went into the industry and I do a lot of. Um, I'm on a lot of the interviewing committees and I work with the new associates that come in. And I started to work with some of the females that were in our associate development program that I created there. And I just made the assumption trying to mentor them into, you know, more of a leadership role long term. And I got two of them that literally looked at me and said, no, 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 I want to be technical. Hell yeah. And so that was like, I had to change my perception too and just really realize. And I've seen some really strong um, students as well say that to me. Like, you know, I think I mentored a SANS yeah. class at your joint one mm -hmm. time and had a young lady in there who was just insistent that she would score better on the the she did. exam than, than I did. I wouldn't be surprised. I think I only got a 90 on that and one. And just recently she moved into a more technical role. Awesome. Awesome. I, I'm going to get her on here sometime. I'm going to try anyway. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I want to be respectful of it. I know you've got a jet here. Um, Can I give it, out a plug for I, ISSA? I, I, please. I heard you may have uh, been been promoted. Is it a promotion scheme? Well, I don't think anything's been announced yet. You know, we still have a president, but I was nominated for president four times and didn't have a competitor. So I guess that means that's me. Well, congratulations. And so- Nice one. Yeah. So the, what does ISSA stand for? The- Information Systems Security Association. So a, it's an international um, group that has local chapters. And so, what are the handful of the big ones in West Michigan too? They're great. I hope my board- is as enthusiastic about adding new opportunities as I am. I I'm, I think that I know the guy who's doing education. Right now. He's got some ideas. He's got some ideas. So the G R I S S A. Do you know the website right off the top of your head? It's Garissa. Garissa dot org. <laughs> yeah, Garissa. And uh, anything else you want to plug? Do you do the social medias, um, sort of publicly? So I have a LinkedIn, but I'm one of those rare tech people who's never had a Facebook. Wow. I have. I'm on my second because we. Uh, we violate the terms of service of Facebook and we have a family account. Don't tell them. See, and you can tell I've never had a Facebook when I call it a Facebook, yeah. right? <laughs> Once upon a time, it wasn't the name of the website the Facebook? The Facebook, yeah. 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 Nice. I, I have one. I used to have one. I don't have one anymore. Um, but I. How I was have, that getting out of that? It was. Probably hard. Yeah. It, you know, um, there were parts of it that were hard, but honestly, it was, ended up being a lot easier than I thought because. The reason I wanted to stop doing it is because I started to hate it. Ah. Um, and so... Did it consume you? No. I just... Um, I, I would... It was a, a time waster. Such a time waster. And, and not in a like all-consuming way in that I would look through it thinking that I would be enriched. Yeah. And I was actually the opposite of enriched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it Imported. became... Yes, exactly. And so I would it became quite easy to just be like, I don't want to be not enriched anymore. Right. So, but, um, I, I initially got one because it was this very, 
very exclu- exclusive only for people who were in college could have an account. Yes. So I, I don't have one either. So, so I love know. LinkedIn because how would you ever keep track of your contacts without it? I could yeah. never go back. There's an amazing book called Selfie uh, written by this British dude who talks about how like evolution impacted where we are today. And like you're we are basically smart monkeys designed to work in tribes of about 160 humans. And beyond that, we've exceeded the human brain's capacity to, to make and keep connections. So there are many people on my LinkedIn. I had one of them say, oh, Drew, what's up? To me in the hallway of the college. And you were like, like, who are you? And I was like, hi. Yeah. So, <laughs> and don't you love that Facebook gives you an opportunity to look at people's idealized version of themselves as best as they can make. Right. Just well, with the intention of making everybody else feel bad about them. Well, that's like a whole nother thing and a different, a whole nother show and podcast, like episode, whatever. But yes, yeah, this idea that it's really what people post is distilled down to the very greatest and even sometimes actually more great than what is actually their greatest. And so all you see is, wow, this person has such an amazing life. My life's terrible. And it becomes this crazy, you know, depressing cycle when in actual fact, everybody's life's terrible. (laughs) Well, now to give Facebook its due, my one best moment with Facebook, I will remember I was working at a TV station in Grand Rapids and I literally popped up from my computer and like danced around the office when I discovered that the guy who bullied me had wound up doing time and was apparently (laughs) having a a terrible, terrible, like prison tats and shape, just Um, looking rough. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. That's exactly what should have happened to you. (laughs) There's been magical moments on Facebook. I got connected to a couple of great communities here because of it, but it's become. So you guys are making me think that I'm still doing ethology, right? (laughs) Watching the, watching the, the herd take care of each other or not. It's kind of what we're doing. We're we're just all grooming. Yeah. We're just sort of giant cats here. Thank you very much for stopping by. I appreciate you. Um, I love everything you do for the West Michigan Cyber and Security And I'd like to tell community. anybody out there, if you want to be part of the field, join the community, right? There's always something cool to do. One day you'll be an Something to intern. listen to, something to volunteer on. Next thing you know, you're the closest thing you can be to a spy in the private sector. Yes. Cool. I think we can end on that. Feasible Reasoning is produced at the Epic Studios of Grand Rapids Community College Media Technologies Department. Epically executive produced by Noah D. Smith and hosted by me, Drew Roseman.